Okay, today's talk at the moment is Real-Time Vulnerability Analytics by Using Principles from U.S. Tsunami Warning Center by Amol Sarwit. Um, he is the head of security research at Cloud Passage Inc. And he heads Cloud Passage worldwide security research responsible for cloud-focused vulnerability and compliance research. He's devoted his career to protecting, securing, and educating the community from security threats. Here is Amal. Well, thank you. All right, so the talk, the, the title of the talk is already mouthful, real-time vulnerability analytics uh, by using principles from the US uh, Tsunami Warning Center. So um, uh, as Tatiana mentioned, my name is Amol, and uh, yeah, during my day job, what we do at uh, Cloud Passage is we provide solutions for um, for, for securing and visibility of your cloud containers and traditional workloads. So uh, real-time vulnerability analytics has been a pretty old topic. I mean, this is, uh, people have been trying to get real-time information on vulnerabilities for the last, I don't know, how, how, how many years do you think that's happening? I think about 20, 25 years even. Because I remember when I was in the mid 90s, late 90s, I was working for one of the security vendors. And even 20, 25 years ago, this topic of vulnerability analytics and real time vulnerability analytics was there. So, why is it that after almost 20 to 25 years, I am still here talking about real time vulnerability analytics and, well, there are a few people here uh, trying, trying, uh, wanting to discuss that. And I think the main reason for that is the vulnerability landscape just changes so rapidly and it does not really matter if this is, uh, if this is 10 year old, 20 year old, I'm pretty sure 10 to 15 years down the line, we'll still be talking about vulnerabilities, vulnerability analytics and how to spot them. So um, in, uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes, what we'll do is uh, we will uh, look at the problem definition, we'll look at uh, sort of a newer approach uh, that we took this time. Uh, we will go over some of the design and implementation of that. We'll go over a lot of examples because I just, uh, I mean, it's, it's good to have design, implementation, approach, but when you see a system working with some working examples, that's when uh, it, really, uh, it really solidifies what you're trying to say. So we'll go over a lot of examples, and then at the end of the day, we'll, uh, we'll conclude and look at some of the future work that this project uh, will do. So uh, let's get started. I mean, this, uh, I put this slide because uh, really speaking, all of us see a tsunami of vulnerabilities, attacks, uh, exploits coming your way every day. I think uh, some of you must be security practitioners, some of you could be working at security vendors. Uh, in, in some respect, everyone is working somehow in the security landscape. And we see this really tsunami of vulnerabilities uh, each and every day. And uh, this, is a, this is a slide from cvedetails.com. Everyone knows here what a CVE is, right? Does it? Okay. Everyone knows what a CVE is. It's, it's essentially a unique identifier that is given to a vulnerability. And there are many companies, uh, one of them is CV Details, they track how many vulnerabilities. Uh, these are the vulnerabilities uh, by year, and on the right-hand side is uh, 2019, last year, where there were, according to them, about 12,000 unique vulnerabilities. And mind you, these are just unique vulnerabilities. So one of these vulnerability can be used by many proof of concepts by many exploits, by many um, viruses, uh, malware, and things like that. So it gets really quickly multiplied by the amount of uh, bad things happening in the industry. And then uh, it's at the end of the day in your organization, you have 
uh, hundreds and thousands of assets. So it again gets multiplied by those number of assets. So these are just unique vulnerabilities. Just to show off hands, how, how do generally, and you can just, this is a small enough uh, room, how, how do you currently get your vulnerability information? NVD, NIST, CVE details, vendor, um, what, what do you currently rely on? Anyone wants to volunteer? All of the above. Okay, that, that's, 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 that's a very good strategy because again, um, getting it from just one source is, is, is not really uh, gonna cut it. So the point of this slide is that when we have so many unique vulnerabilities coming in, and this is just these are just the approximate numbers because as you know, there are some vulnerabilities in the NVD database which are not in this database, which are not in that database, so you're always like sort of uh, scrambling for uh, finding the truth, and also not just the truth, but what's the vulnerability of that day, what is uh, essentially of highest criticality for that day. So uh, this is a screenshot of, uh, of the Pacific uh, Tsunami Warning Center. Now, now you would say, why, why tsunamis all of a sudden? Because there is a little bit of a correlation or a similarity between vulnerabilities and uh, tsunamis. So the root, root cause of a tsunami are essentially earthquakes and uh, Earthquakes can occur at any time. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the root cause of most tsunamis are earthquakes. There are also obviously landslide, volcanic eruption, some other causes also. But the root cause of tsunamis are earthquakes which cannot be predicted. But still, even though earthquakes cannot be predicted, tsunami warning centers do exist and they give us very timely information on uh, the tsunamis that are going to hit our shores. So earthquakes can be compared to vulnerabilities. Just like earthquakes, you cannot really predict vulnerabilities. Like I really, I can tell you like maybe five minutes ago what was the high profile vulnerability, but I cannot predict what uh, what's going to be the most uh, trending or high profile or seismic vulnerability by the end of this talk. So similar to uh, earthquakes, you cannot predict vulnerabilities, but still you have um, tsunami warning centers that give us information in the nick of time on, uh, on, on the dangers that are to come. So a thought came to my mind is like, if you can have uh, tsunami warning centers um, implemented in real life, why can't we have a similarly vulnerability warning centers which sort of get same cues which are based on similar principles, similar ideas uh, of a tsunami warning center. So I said okay let's take a quick two minute look at how these tsunami warning centers work. So what they have done is essentially, and I, I, I promise this will not take more than two minutes. I know you are here for vulnerabilities and not knowing about tsunamis. So uh, what, what happens is they have a bunch of sensors at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, almost bolted or they have like heavy weight so that there are these uh, sensors which are at the bottom of the ocean and they continuously are monitoring for some seismic activity. These sensors have, uh, I think it's too far for the laser. The sensors at the bottom of the ocean, they have uh, some sort of, a, sort of a bi-directional communication with uh, some of the buoys which are floating on the water. Now what these buoys do is they uh, get data of uh, seismic, seismic activity happening at the bottom of the ocean. They also collect data, uh, additional data like uh, temp water temperature, uh, surface temperature, wind, a lot of additional data nearby. And then you have multiple of such sensors and buoys which have, and the buoys are, uh, they, have, they have good power, they can talk with satellites which then later communicate your data to the data centers. So um, essentially to summarize, you have some sensors at the ocean floor which get data to the buoys. The buoys get the most important seismic data as well as data 
uh, metadata or data for uh, wind currents, uh, temperatures, so on and so forth. So collect additional data. The buoys have good power to communicate with the satellites and get the data to the data center. Now, in the, this is this is an example of a real life buoy that you would find in the Pacific somewhere. So once the data comes in the data center, there is a lot of data analytics done, not just based on uh, the seismic data, because that's the number one cause for tsunamis, but also for data, as you said, for uh, historical data, essentially what had happened when such an earthquake occurred and the temperature was this, and a lot of such data analytics is done in the data centers, which at the end of the day raises an alarm, saying that, okay, you could have a tsunami coming in the next few hours or uh, something like that. So, uh, so essentially that was the question is can we use some of these things for can we model our vulnerabilities based on earthquakes. So uh, we just went over a lot of these things uh, which is uh, earthquakes cannot be predicted, vulnerabilities can also not be predicted. Uh, so what we decided was to essentially take three, these three important components which are the sensors and the, uh, and the buoys, the communication and analytics and try to put them in the context of vulnerabilities. So uh, essentially we knew we needed these three things. One is data collection, fast communication and analytics. Uh, for data communication, we uh, thought of a lot of things. Uh, in the past, we had worked with honeypots and those had given us very good results. Uh, everyone knows what a honeypot is, right? I see some, some hands, so, okay. So uh, essentially the, the advantage of honeypots are that you do get to know about live attacks and threats. Uh, which is really good, but there are also some disadvantages. One of the biggest disadvantage is that the vulnerability has to be weaponized and being used in real life by either some attackers or by some uh, vulnerability scanners from one of the vendors who are scanning the internet continuously for your honeypot to catch that vulnerability. So it's already a uh, a little too late because at that time a proof of concept for the vulnerability is already out there. Uh, someone has already converted the proof of concept into a mechanized script or something which really works or in the worst case uh, adversaries are already making use of that vulnerability that, and therefore your honeypot was able to catch it. So this time we did not go with honeypots, although I'm not saying honeypots are not useful, they are tremendously useful, but for this particular real time alerting, we thought that honeypots were too slow. Also the type of vulnerabilities that the honeypots can catch are limited. So essentially a honeypot can catch only a vulnerability that uh, essentially has a listening port which uh, attacker can actively send packets to. So again, uh, in, in today's day and world with CI, CD and you know, a, a lot of you are ops engineers, nowadays you don't even have SSH running. Uh, the, the, the usability of honeypots for at least for this project was, was not really great. Well, the second thing that we have always, we had always done as an industry also, and as well as me personally in my career was um, analysis, reverse engineering, manually tracking of these threats. And this is also a very effective approach, uh, especially reverse engineering and manual analysis, because you can actually tell what the attacker was thinking uh, when he or she wrote that code or that piece of malware. But again, for the purpose of this project, it was, uh, it, it, it just cannot scale in the sense you cannot get real time vulnerability analysis, uh, analysis data on manual reversing. It is a very effective tool to know the nuts and bolts of a particular um, malware or exploit, but uh, scaling it is an issue, timing is an issue. Also, uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, this is not a reverse engineering talk, but uh, it is a fantastic tool. But for this purpose that we were, and, and we, have, we have successfully used this in the past, 
but for this particular um, problem that we wanted to solve, which is real time um, vulnerability alerting, that just was not going to work. So instead what we said was instead of going to a totally honeypot reverse engineering manual tracking that type of solution let's go with something that a lot of people are doing which is uh, collecting uh, public information on attacks on exploits on data leaks uh, via um, various uh, blogs via various exploit databases via uh, even things like Twitter and LinkedIn. And let's try to see if we can get better data that way than going through the way of honeypots and trying to capture the actual attacks and things like that. So we said, okay, let's, let's give this a try. So the technology we used, there is nothing very specific about this. This is just some tools that we were already familiar with, so we just used those. So we created this uh, system in AWS. We used, uh, if you remember, we, we needed three different components. One is data collection. So we wrote a bunch of uh, Lambda functions for data collection. And we'll get into the details on how these Lambdas look like and what did they do. For storage, we used a really old style Postgres SQL database because the data that we were looking at was not like in petabyte type of data. I mean, you have under the sun maybe 150,000 or so unique vulnerabilities. So if you even multiply that with five or 10, you're not going to uh, get a petabyte of data or something like that. So our data was relatively small. So a simple old school SQL database would have sufficed and it did. And then we wrote a bunch of uh, data analytics function which would sort of process this data and, uh, and then give it weights and so on and so forth, which we'll look, uh, look at that, uh, in, in a moment. So the design of the system was like this. So we had a bunch of data collection lambdas. Each of this lambda function collected data from a particular source. So one of the lambda function, let's say, collected data from uh, NVD. This is a very common source. I think most of you would already have it. One of the lambda functions collected data from one of the exploit databases, free databases like exploit DB or some of the proprietary or paid exploit databases. Uh, one lambda function, uh, as I said, it, it went through just some of the security researcher blogs that we have trusted uh, for uh, so many years. Um, some, of, some of the lambda functions just browsed through uh, vendor advisories and vendor feeds and the information that vendors like Microsoft, Red Hat, all these vendors come up with. And uh, all this data, one, one of the Lambda functions was for Twitter, because whenever there is a high profile vulnerability before the, like uh, everyone sort of talks about it, there are some few key, key uh, folks who talk about it, tweet about it. So we said, hey, let's not forget that data. Let's scrape that data as well. So we got that data. And all this data went into our database which was then given to the analytics uh, lambda. Now the analytics lambda, what it did was, it, well, it is a very simple weight-based uh, algorithm. This is not AI, this is not ML, I know. I mean, at this age and day, if you are talking at a security conference and if you're not doing AI or ML, it's almost out. <laughs> uh, but, but we didn't really, at that time, needed that type of capability because our data was not like that. Because for AI ML, you really need a lot of data to learn from, to create your models from, and we just didn't have that type of data. So uh, what our analytics function did was it just uh, assigned weights to each of these sources and then calculated the resultant for that particular vulnerability or CVE. So to give you an example, the weight for the Lambda function which, uh, which got data from NVD was very low. Very, and, and the reason for that is NVD we knew it's a data source for vulnerabilities. Just because a vulnerability is on NVD does not really mean that it's a high pri priority vulnerability, it's a tsunami type of vulnerability or it's, uh, it can cause like a seismic shift in 
uh, your organization. So the weightage given for data sources like NVD was really low. If a vulnerability uh, was found on one of the exploit databases, then yeah, the weight for that would be a little bit higher because now it's not just on uh, NVD on one or one of your data uh, collection, um, one of your uh, vulnerability databases, but it is also being exploited. If it is found, uh, if uh, the data analytics did some analysis on on the blogs that we were uh, looking at, and from the analysis, if the data analytics engine found that this vulner this this particular blog is talking about an uh, exploit or a possible exploit about that vulnerability, then the weight for that was higher, and th that in that part, uh, some of the uh, natural language processing and those type of algorithms were used, uh, but initially we gave gave them also very low weight because we were not really very confident on how well they work. So, uh, for example, given a blog post, uh, you are writing a computer program to find out what it is about. If it is about a vulnerability, what is the um, what is, uh, is is the blog post uh, saying that this is a low profile vulnerability, medium profile vulnerability, or high profile vulnerability? You can do do those type of things, and we have done those. But initially, we even gave those uh, a little bit low priority. I think uh, high priority was given to things like uh, just. Uh, how many times you saw that same type of vulnerability in a given period of time from different data sources and from different uh, things from the internet. So uh, that is uh, essentially what this uh, analytics engine did. And then it created as an output of the system was uh, some graphs and some charts that would tell you uh, on uh, what it thinks, what the system thinks are the really seismic vulnerabilities, the really high profile vulnerabilities uh, for that particular hour, that particular day, and so on and so forth. So we ran this engine continuously and uh, started uh, watching the results. As a matter of fact, now the engine is running for about two years and uh, mm, let me let me give you an example of some of the data that we collected in the first month so we started in uh, december of 2017 about 2 years ago and this is what uh, so we had we started the engine we said okay and then there were some vacations christmas we we, we went home when we came back in jan this is what we saw the data at that time uh, we and uh, on the on the x-axis, uh, what you have are the days. So currently, I've plotted the data per day. And on the y-axis, what you have is the vulnerability intelligence quotient. So it is just a number that the algorithm created for that particular CVE or that particular vulner vulnerability. And the dots that you see, those are individual vulnerabilities. So in one month, which is which was a very short time, we saw, we, we saw that, okay, this particular uh, Microsoft malware protection remote code execution vulnerability came on top. Uh, the second one was Palo Alto Network's uh, uh, Pan OS uh, remote code execution based on the, uh, on the management interface. So, I mean, we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are responsible for, uh, in our day jobs, we, what we do is we look at these vulnerabilities, create data sets for detection of these vulnerabilities, release these data sets so that uh, same day, next day, whatever, as quickly as possible, our customers can identify these vulnerabilities in their organization. So we were pretty familiar with the landscape, and then when, when all the engineers looked at the data, we said that, yeah, if we had to do this manually, we also would have sort of rated these two uh, vulnerabilities on top. Now, vulnerability classification is as much as a, <laughs> uh, as much as art and science. So there could be many other remote code execution vulnerabilities. There could be many other uh, vulnerabilities that have a more grave impact. But then you have to take into consideration a lot of different aspects of that vulnerability. So for example, uh, 
if there is a vulnerability in, in the malware protection engine itself, which is supposed to cause, uh, catch malware, and if that belongs to a very widely known operating system, then you would say, yes, I would put that on top, or things like that. But anyway, the first month data, we were pretty happy with it. We were not very confident with it because it was just an experiment. What we decided was to just keep the, keep, keep, keep the engine running and see what data it gives over the course of time. These are just some of the parameters of the two vulnerabilities that I discussed. Uh, these are from various open sources, their CVSS scores and uh, things like that. By the way, uh, in, 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 the, in the data analytics part of it, we did not use the CVSS uh, submetrics for this vulnerability and you will, you will come, I'll, I'll discuss why that, why that was the case. Everyone knows about CVSS or have heard about that, right? Anyone? It's, it's essentially just a scoring system uh, where every vulnerability is scored and it is a very fantastic uh, system uh, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more later. So uh, after a month of data, we said, okay, data is trickling in and everything is fine. But just in five days, about in, in, in Jan of 2018, sort of the alarm started to go off. And uh, you can see the December data, which is on the right-hand side of, uh, well, yeah, on the right-hand side. And in Jan, it's just alarm started going off. We started hitting vulnerabilities that were five times more that we have ever seen. Anyone, anyone try to guess what, what these vulnerabilities could be in Jan of 2018? So these, I'm sorry, so you, you said something? Uh, uh, eternal blue will come. <laughs> so these were the meltdown and the spectre vulnerabilities, if you remember. I mean, uh, these were in the Intel CPU microprocessors, and uh, since they were in the microprocessor side channel type of attacks, everyone and anyone was affected. They were more um, cloud providers were affected by it because you know they used Intel processors and. Um, I don't think we need any introduction to, for these two vulnerabilities. So when again, we in, in, in our meetings, when we looked at it, we said, oh, cool. I mean, looks like the system is doing what it is supposed to do because these were, as you could remember, in the last 10 years, I did not remember uh, any bigger vulnerability of this magnitude which uh, affected so many systems and had uh, really like a tsunami type of seismic uh, impact. So we were highly encouraged by the results uh, because usually we see these low level vulnerabilities and then uh, all of a sudden meltdown spectre, uh, the counts went up. Um, so uh, when we talked about this internally to our security teams, uh, we, <laughs> we soon came to a realization that we needed an easy way to classify this. We cannot go and give them the y-axis, which is the vulnerability quotient, which could be like 2,875. I mean, if a person looks at, if a security person looks at it, he's going to say, "What? What is this? It's compared to what? I mean, how do I know that 100 is good and 2,000 is bad?" So there was, I mean, very quickly we realized that uh, just the raw numbers are not going to cut it if we want this to be adapt, uh, adopted even <laughs> internally. So we came up with a classification system, uh, low, elevated, high, and critical. And this uh, classification system was based, again, not on a very complex formula or something, but it was uh, simply ratios and we just fine-tuned these ratios a bit. So this is what uh, we came at that time, the green verse, the low priority, um, the, the, then the yellows, orange, which is not looking like orange here, and then, then the red ones. So essentially, if, you classify, if we classified them into these different categories, it was just a lot easier for everyone in the company and possibly we had some other POC vendor, uh, customers to understand what the data is. 
So uh, interesting facts and we are still in just the first month of this is that in the same month if you look at the CVSS scores uh, on the left hand side are the CVSS scores of various vulnerabilities that found that were found exactly in that month you see that there were about 96 vulnerabilities the one in the at the end which were of score between 9 to 10. So the most, the highest priority vulnerabilities according to CVSS, there were 96 such vulnerabilities that, that month. But uh, in our alerting system, we found four. And that actually was very encouraging because as uh, security practitioners, you would know that you, were, you, you, you get essentially the entire industry and security practitioners are flooded with this tsunami of vulnerabilities where everything is uh, security uh, score rating of 10. So if everything has a security score of a rating of 10, how, how do you really classify what's a seismic uh, type of vulnerability and what's a vulnerability that just getting the score of 10 because uh, it checks all these boxes. It is a remote code execution. It can be accessed over the network. Access complexity is low and things like that. So again, I'm, uh, I'm not against CVSS. In fact, we have used CVSS uh, for a lot of years. And I was, act I mean, one of, um, one of my previous employers when I was working there, we were actively involved in creating this uh, CVSS standard. So it is definitely very important. I think if you remember uh, the days before CVSS, there was a big uh, sort of chaos in the industry because every vendor used to rate their, uh, their particular vulnerability differently. And uh, CVSS came in and sort of mm, really calmed that down. And this was one central authority, MITRE, uh, which, uh, which gave scores and they sort of um, did and still keep doing very good work. But uh, one of the things that you see just because of the nature of the C C uh, nature of CVSS is that it is strictly a formula based system. So it does not take into consideration a lot of things like uh, mm, what, uh, what if the vulnerability is exploited currently in the wild or what our security researchers think, think about, do think about this vulnerability. What is the possibility of this vulnerability to become big or really get exploited? So uh, some of the vendors like Microsoft on every patch Tuesday, they actually, they give a very good guidance that uh, what, uh, what do they expect? Would this vulnerability be exploited in the next 30 days? Uh, which is their sort of guess again. So all those things are uh, not present in CVSS as a result of which a lot of vulnerabilities, these are just one month of vulnerabilities and you had about 96 vulnerabilities with a score of 10, the highest score. Um, and I, I think our system gave just four, which were actually just these two vulnerabilities, the meltdown and uh, uh, Spectre, each of them had two CVE, so that became four. So um, we said, okay, let's keep collecting data. I mean, any of such project, we, we want to really make sure that we have good data. And in the next six months, uh, we, 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 we collected some more data. Nothing seismic happened as Spectre and Meltdown, which was actually good because we do not want to alert people. We do not want to alert ourselves saying that, hey, there is un every day there is some huge vulnerability. So in the next six months, we didn't find any vulnerability that could crack that uh, red, uh, red barrier, which would go into uh, the likes of uh, Spectre and Meltdown. There were some vulnerabilities which were in orange, and I think I've highlighted one or two. One was the Drupal code execution vulnerability. Another one was a pretty big DHCP uh, client script code execution vulnerability. And again, uh, since we look at these vulnerabilities day in and day out, like w one of the things that we did was we had just these weekly reviews of what the system produced with our engineers to say that, hey, if you had to manually classify a vulnerability, would you really do it this way? And we were sort of taking that manual uh, analysis of our security engineers to see if their system is producing correct results or at least expected results or not. 
So that's what happened in uh, six months again. Now, if you had been using CVSS, there were more than a thousand CVSS uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities with CVSS score of 10. And again, I'm not even looking at the greens and the orange and the yellows. These are, I'm just looking at the last uh, bar in the CVSS diagram. These are the level 10 vulnerabilities. So nothing can, these are the vulnerabilities that have the highest score of uh, between nine to 10. So there were about 1,000 there, and we were still at four, which were the, still the Spectre and uh, Meltdown, which again uh, was a very good thing because if you want, you can go down and look at the 19 high priority ones, or you can go down further and look at the 995 yellow or elevated ones. But uh, I think the um, what what most of the most of the challenge that the in industry is having is prioritization, and uh, um, I think this uh, this actually tells a very good story. So we said, okay, um, let's keep it running. One year data. So we we did see uh, in, in in one year we did see some vulnerabilities that. Uh, that way that that started becoming like meltdown or like uh, uh, spectre so one of these vulnerabilities i think you may remember it was a ssh vulnerability so someone could connect uh, without any credentials to your ssh server if you are not recalling it there are cvs at the end of the presentation so do look up and that got a really high hit. Again, when we did, we were always doing manual sort of analysis to see if the system is producing correct results. And uh, yeah, I mean, all the security engineers said, yeah, it's a SSH vulnerability logging in remotely without <laughs> credentials. That's, 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 that's a big event. So uh, at this point, we were pretty confident. We sort of expanded on uh, some of uh, our POC customers and started talking about this. Um, and also kept comparing against uh, CVSS, uh, which uh, by now, I mean, if you had done your triage based on CVSS, you would have to go through about 1,500 vulnerabilities, which you say are really, really critical. And it does not work when you say thousands of vulnerabilities are the most critical vulnerabilities. I mean, nine or 10 vulnerabilities you say 10 the system that we developed it produced 10 vulnerabilities in a year that were really critical and then that is manageable if you say i have 1500 vulnerabilities which have a score between 9 to 10 and then again uh, some 2000 vulnerabilities between 8 to 9 then it's just uh, in real life i'm sure you can relate to this it just doesn't doesn't scale um, fast forward uh, there's your blue keep. Mm, uh, what we saw was, um, again, the Microsoft uh, blue, keep, blue Keep RDP vulnerability that w was able to crack into the red zone in about 1.5 years. And then we also had uh, this WhatsApp vulnerability by which you could send a packet uh, and just cause uh, remote code execution on, on, on the WhatsApp messenger that also cracked uh, into the red. Um, so data look pretty good. Again, we did comparison with CVSS, same thing. And this is essentially all the data that we have collected in the last uh, two years or so. Just a few weeks ago, um, there were a few vulnerabilities like the now, this is few weeks old, so I'm assuming at security professionals, all of you have heard about this. This is the vulnerability that was found by NSA. They reported it to Microsoft. It was a, a vulnerability in the way certificates are processed. So that, well, there are two aspects of it. Let me first tell you why this vulnerability now is the highest ranking vulnerability in our two-year database. If you see to the left, even the Meltdown and Spectre, those vulnerabilities, uh, in the, they, they are really low as compared to this. And secondly, I would like to talk about the change that, I, that we did to the algorithm that scores this. Now you see that the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities, they are now 
in orange and no longer in red because now we have a new king and now we have a new red we have someone who has taken that spot up so we'll talk about these two things so the curve ball vulnerability i mean uh, it's uh, it was in the elliptical curve algorithm essentially your certificates are signed with uh, various uh, either rsa or elliptical curve or something like that and the vulnerability was in the implementation of the elliptical curves so what windows do is that when when it gets a certificate it stores it in the in its cache and when it looks at another certificate it compares the signature to the signature of what it has in the cache but the implementation flaw was that it did not check what curve was being used so it just does not have to see if the signatures match uh, but you also have to see what al curve algorithm was used and windows i mean and, and it happens with i mean there it's nothing against windows i can point you to like many other vulnerabilities in each operating systems that are like this but um, even after 25 years uh, in windows there was a flaw where it did not uh, compare that curve algorithm because of which anyone could create a fraudulent certificate for google.com bank of america.com anything and in your browser when you open that site it will just appear as a good certificate or essentially you could uh, you could fool uh, fool in believing that this is a valid certificate so I mean, when our engineers saw, I mean, when any, I mean, when you hear about it, you can immediately tell, right? Oh, by God, this is like, wow, the fundamental of fundamentals of security, TLS, and public key cryptography. It's uh, obviously not a flaw in the algorithm, but in the implementation of the algorithm. So, uh, once again, we were, we are at this point very confident that this uh, sort of. Uh, Mm, art slash science system <laughs> that we have built uh, is giving us pretty good results and alerting us only on the highest uh, criticality or our highest priority or our really seismic vulnerabilities and we can sort of ignore a lot of the low level noise. Now the second thing which I mentioned I wanted to talk about was that we changed our algorithm on how they are scored. So now if someone got a score of like, let's say 2800 which is the same as Meltdown and Spectre, we would only give that an orange and not a red. And we are still debating on how to change it. We would need to change the score because the way the system works is it collects data from a lot of sources. And as you know, there is more and more data generated on vulnerabilities. So we do expect that we will get higher and higher scores going forward. So this is the first time in two years we changed the scoring mechanism. I think our what we are thinking is that we should, instead of doing this in one go, we sort of need to change the scoring slowly as we go because as the system collects more and more data, this, the way it works right now is the scores are slowly getting uh, higher up and up. So that's the second thing that uh, I was uh, I would like I was wanting to point out. So, well, if anything, just take a screenshot of this uh, <laughs> this uh, slide. I'm sure th uh, the slides are available for download as well, but you can take a picture. If you are a practitioner, just go back and make sure you don't have these sort of top ten bad boys of uh, in the last two years which at least according to the system that we built had the highest uh, or the seismic level of these vulnerabilities were really high and they could really cause a tsunami of flood of viruses, worms or really bad things in your organization. So our future work, uh, one is definitely we are, think, we are looking at how to deliver this data to the community, how to make uh, these a bunch of, uh, the, the, this project, open source project and expose it to the community. So that is, I think right now, the top priority. Uh, 
as far as the project itself is concerned, we are thinking on classification. So not everyone is interested in every vulnerability. So if you are doing, let's say, application security at company ABC, then you may not be interested in the Kubernetes vulnerability or some infrastructure vulnerability. You maybe have uh, only dedicated focus, uh, area of focus. So that is something that we are uh, thinking of adding so that you can just subscribe to the vulnerabilities or type of vulnerabilities that you would like to see and then the system can just give you the same results but only filter them based on your preferences. Uh, more um, sort of correlation with uh, targeted attacks, malware, uh, exploits and things like that. We already have something in place but we want to expand it more and also some root cause analysis and classification so that if uh, as an industry you can see that okay for most of my vulnerabilities of type this they were caused because of this and then as an industry we can just improve on on that root cause. Again, I mentioned earlier, we currently do not use, we, we do use some AI, but not, not, not I, I would say the bulk of the system does not really use ML or AI. And there have been so many uh, ready to use uh, libraries and things like that in AWS, GCP, and Azure, that now it has come to a point where we could theoretically really train our algorithm to read tons and tons of blog posts every day, find out what the, the meaning of the blog post automatically and come to a severity. And then we can compare that with our existing severity mechanism and then sort of get some interesting results saying that, okay, we, it is possible now for us to write a crawler who can just read through all the blogs, all the research articles, all the papers that are being published and really find the meaning of those papers. So that is an interesting um, thing that we would like to do going forward. So that's it for the talk. I think we have maybe one or two minutes or maybe not. Uh, I think we do have a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, I apologize, the slide is not set up. So if you have a question, just raise your hand high, keep it up and I'll bring you the microphone. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Amal. Thank you.